Hello, this is the Bible study for uh, 1 John for this week. This is our uh, number six in our series, going through the letter of 1 John in the Bible, doing a Bible study on this uh, letter that Paul wrote later in his life. And I'm glad you've uh, tuned in to join into this Bible study. We're going to be looking at uh, 1 John chapter 3, verses 11 through 24. Uh, today, if you want to get your Bibles open to that, we'll read that scripture. And uh, it's about loving one another. Let me start with a story before you even read the scripture. Uh, a woman was surprised at church one day when another woman who had always snubbed her went out of her way to give her a big hug before the service. She wondered what had initiated her change of heart. She got her answer at the end of the service when the pastor instructed, your assignment for the next week is the same as last week. I want you to go out there and love somebody you just can't stand. Well, I'm sure that didn't go over too well with the person who just heard that news. Uh, if loving others was only as easy as giving a hug to someone you don't like, we could all do it. Uh, just hug them and move on. But love is a little bit more difficult than that. It requires continual effort. Because when we love someone, we're actually putting them up ahead of ourselves, and that's not easy. So John returns to this theme in uh, 1 John about loving each other. It's one of the main themes of this letter. 1 John chapter 3, beginning in verse 11. says, This is the message you've heard from the beginning. We should love one another. Do not be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. Do not be surprised, my brothers, if the world hates you. We know that we've passed from death to life because we love our brothers. Anyone who does not love remains in death. Anyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life in him. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need and has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? Dear children, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and in truth. This, then, is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence. Whenever our hearts condemn us, for God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God. And receive from him anything we ask, because we obey his commands and do what pleases him. And this is his command, to believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he's commanded us. Those who obey his commands live in him, and he in them. And this is how we know that he lives in us. We know it by the Spirit he gave us. So let's take a look at this passage and kind of work through it a little bit. We see the first off in verse 11 that God's desire is for us to love each other. Now, it's not a new message. It's been there uh, throughout the church. It's certainly been there even in the Old Testament times. In way back in Leviticus chapter 19, it says, Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against one of your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. So that's way back in the Old Testament. It was telling them to love each other. And Jesus made it clear. When he was asked what the greatest commandment was, he replied, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. But then he said, the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. So Jesus places great importance on loving others. And uh, a biblical definition of love is a self-sacrificing, caring commitment that shows itself in seeking the highest good of the one loved. It is loving like Jesus loved us. This is something this is something we know but it must be more than we know it must be something that we do. Now in this letter Paul in verses 12 through 15 gives us this opposite of loving others. Uh, there's a, all another way to live and it's Satan's desire for us is literally to hate each other. Hatred is the opposite of love. Um, we could define hate to, hatred as this as a selfish insensitive attitude that shows itself in disregarding others' good as they seek my own interest. Hatred is a characteristic of a world that is in rebellion against God, as love is a characteristic of the church that's trusted in God. So 
we're told here that we must reject the example of a man named Cain in the scripture. Cain is a bad example. Uh, Cain and Abel were both brothers, uh, and they were sons of Adam and Eve, the first man and woman. Uh, they both offered sacrifices to God. Abel's sacrifice was accepted by God, which tells us it was presented properly and with faith. Cain's sacrifice was rejected, which tells us there was something wrong with the way he did it, or likely with his heart. And Cain went away angry. Now God warned Cain that if he did what was right, he would be accepted. And he warned that sin was crouching at his door and it desires to master you. Now Cain, we know in the story, did not listen to God's warning and he killed his brother out of anger and jealousy. Behind the actions of Cain was a self-centered spirit, spirit. Rarely will that spirit go to the extent of murder, but it, it, in this case it did. But that root is there. Uh, and that's the example of Cain that we have to reject. We must also reject the influence of the evil one. You see, behind the actions of Cain was the devil. Cain was, of course, still responsible, but the devil was the one who tempted him to do what he did. John writes that Cain did what he did because he belonged to the evil one. Wow, that's quite a, a analogy, isn't it? We be, he belonged to the evil one. Uh, if our hearts are full of a hatred, we belong to the evil one. We actually become a tool that Satan can use in his hand to spread evil. We know that love originates in the love of God, but hatred originates in the heart of the devil. God shares his love with the world, and the devil is sharing his hatred with the world. And so here we have the conflict. So we have to reject the atmosphere of death. Reject the atmosphere of death. John writes that anyone who does not love remains in death. Previously, John wrote about the contrast between light and darkness. Um, you know, light represents living in the fellowship with God, living the, the holy life, and darkness is, represents sin in the sinful life. Now, if we love each other, we're in the light. But if we do not love each other, we're in darkness. It's that simple. Uh, the, the analogy he uses here is between life and death. To love others is to be in life, but to not love others is to be in death. And of course, this is referring to a spiritual death. Uh, when we're born into God's family, we are born into a new life. We must receive Jesus Christ as our Savior, but until we do that, we're spiritually dead. And when we're saved, we pass from death to life. If we do not love our brothers and sisters in Christ, we're given evidence that we've not passed from death to life, that we still remain in death. And I think the emphasis here is on an ongoing pattern of our lives, not the occasional slip up, but an ongoing pattern of not loving others. But when we continually live without loving others, we're choosing this atmosphere of death, choosing a polluted atmosphere, polluted with selfishness and bitterness and envy and revenge and hatred. And that atmosphere chokes out God's blessing and uh, out of our lives. So we have to reject the atmosphere of death. We also should reject the, uh, the sin of hatred. Hatred is the way of the world that is in rebellion to God. Paul writes to, in, in his letter in Titus, he says, At one time we were too a foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. So that's the way they used to live. That's not the way we're supposed to live. So we have to reject this selfish attitude of hatred and replace it with the love of God. They cannot exist together. Hatred begins in the heart. And even if it's never acted out, it's still hatred. And we must reject the spirit of hatred. We also must reject the sin of murder. Cain is an example of how John uses to show that hatred can progress even to the, the extent of murder. Obviously, uh, most people don't murder people. So how does that apply to us? Well, Jesus said these words, in the Sermon on the Mount, he said, anyone who hates his brother is a murderer. Just as a man who lusts after a woman commits adultery, so if someone hates someone, he, Jesus called him a murderer. The emphasis is on what's in your heart. Um, you can have murder in your heart and never act on it, but still be guilty. 
In John 8, 44, Jesus says, you belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desire. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there's no truth in him. So uh, we need to reject the sin of murder. So let's go back to the positive side here in verses 16 through 18. We are to love others as Christ loved us. Christ is our example. You see, love is truly defined by Christ's sacrificial death for us. John writes, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his love life for us. The definition of love is Jesus. Romans 5, 8 says, but God demonstrated his love for us in this. While we're still sinners, Christ died for us. From the example of Christ, we know that love is a sacrificial, giving kind of love. Jesus died for us. He died for our benefit. That's what true love is. It's focused on the other person. And Jesus is our example. That's how we know what love is. Secondly, we are to love others sacrificially. We ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. Uh, this isn't referring to the fact that we actually literally die for each other, but we put others ahead of us. In, in essence, laying our life down, uh, living sacrificially, living unselfishly, thinking of others and not just ourselves. Like Paul wrote to the Philippians when he said, each of you should look not only to your own interest, but also to the interests of others. So we are to love others sacrificially, again, following the example of Christ. We are, are to love others through acts of compassion. This is one of the ways we love others, um, by meeting someone's need. John writes, if anyone has material possessions and sees a brother in need and has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? You see, the love of God will, will lead us to help others. Uh, if it isn't leading us to help others, then we, we have to question whether we have the love of God in us. In order to this happen, of course, we have to be aware of the need. We have to have the resources that, able to meet the need, and we must be loving enough to want to share. This can believe, could include money or possessions or giving of time or practically helping. And um, in Galatians 6.10, Paul writes, Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to people especially those who belong to the family of believers. So there Paul is emphasizing what John is writing about, that we should do good. We should do acts of compassion to those. Now, it doesn't mean we are the answer for everyone's situation or everyone's problem, but when you become aware of a need and you are able to help and you're willing, then do it. It's a way one that we can show our love to others. Uh, we have to be wise and discerning as we do this, of course, Sometimes when you uh, bail a person out of a situation, you're actually hurting them. Uh, maybe God is trying to teach them something through this, or they need to do something on their own. So we need to be careful. We must be wise and discerning to know when we can help and how, what, if we're, what we're doing is truly helping them. Um, it's, it's fun to see people helping each other. And even during this time, with the virus and people are shut down, not being able to go, I just seen so much evidence in our congregation of people reaching out to each other, people helping each other and giving, getting things for each other and making masks and making food and just all kinds of things. It's really encouraging. Um, so we need to think about that and find ways to reach out in the love of God. Um, some people, when they read the scripture, might say, well, no one's helping me. And, and that, that would be the wrong attitude. Because the kind of love that John's talking about is not worried about me. It's worried about others and doing things for others. So it is a kind of love that longs to help others, not desires to be helped. And so it's an unselfish, compassionate kind of love. We're also to love others through actions. John writes, we're not just to love others with just with our words, but with our actions. Love is an action. Jesus died for us. Uh, that was an action. He didn't just feel something, he did something. And there's a lot of ways that we can um, love each other in the body of Christ and others in our world with our actions. Um, sometimes if you just wait for a feeling to come, it might not ever come. But you can act in loving ways toward people. And often what happens is the feeling will come 
after the uh, action is worked out. So we can choose by our will to love others through our actions. We're also called to love in the truth. We love others in truth. In truth, we desire what is best for the other person. Sometimes that's not to give them what they want. Maybe it would hurt them. Maybe it would make them dependent. Maybe that what they want is wrong. So in truth, we have to be careful to study to show love in the way of truth. We know truth in the, and through the Word of God and by the example of Jesus. Jesus is love, but he's also truth. In love, Jesus said some things that when you read them, you might they seem kind of harsh, but they were in love. Like the young ruler who came to him and, and uh, asked him what I need to do to be saved. And Jesus told him to sell everything and follow him. He was a very rich man. It seems like a hard statement, but the rich man walked away. But the truth was, that's what the man needed to hear. It wasn't unloving for Jesus to say that. It was very loving for Jesus to say that because it was the truth. So we need to speak the truth in love. And sometimes that can be hard. The other person might not interpret what you're saying as being in love, but it is. We need to speak the, the love, the truth of God in love. As we do that, we find blessing. In verses 19 through 22, we see we find that we are blessed with assurance as we love one another. Our love is supposed to be unselfish and giving, but we find when we do love others with this unselfish, giving kind of love, we find ourselves blessed, even though that's not our motive, that's not the reason we do it, but you do find yourself blessed. We enjoy the assurance of peace. John writes, we are at rest in his presence. I like that phrase. Uh, it's talking about peace, to be at peace with God, to be at peace with others, to be at peace with yourselves. There is many people in our world have much of the world's stuff, but they don't have peace. But if you're loving your brothers and sisters, we're blessed with peace. Knowing we've been obedient to God, love to the best of our ability, we enjoy this wonderful peace of God. We also can enjoy confidence in prayer. Uh, John writes, if our friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive from him anything we ask because we obey his commands and do what pleases him. This is a fascinating thing. A benefit of loving our brothers and sisters in Christ is power in our prayer life. If our hearts do not condemn us, John's just been writing about loving people, uh, you know, like Christ loved us. So if we do that, our hearts won't condemn us. We're obeying his commands, and his command is to love each other. We do what pleases him, and... Um, so the way we love others and our prayers are connected. <laughs> it's not like, you know, you're earning points that you can cash in when you pray, but it means our love for each other's evidence we're living in the will of God. And when we're living in the will of God, our prayers get answered. The scripture says, because when we pray according to God's will, it happens. Um, if this is true, and it is, then it could be sometimes our lack of success in prayer might be a problem in our relationship with other people. Maybe before we go to God in prayer, we need to be reconciled with a brother or sister in Christ and then come to the Lord in prayer. But we can have confidence in prayer as we love each other as Christ loved us. In verses 23 and 24, we see that loving one another is not optional. John gives us a very clear command here. It is essential first that we believe in Jesus Christ. Uh, when we believe in Jesus Christ, we're changed. We move from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light, from the land of the dying to the land of the living. We are new people in Christ. We receive the Holy Spirit who pours in our hearts the love of God, and that's the only way that we can love others the way God loves us is because he's given us his love through his Holy Spirit. Uh, we need to believe in Jesus Christ. Uh, it is essential that we love one another. Uh, to love one another is a very clear command. Uh, John writes about it often in this letter. It is the will of God. Uh, if you do a uh, quick Bible search, uh, when I did that, I found that 38 times in the scripture, God commands us to love each other. And there's probably more than that. Jesus said it many times himself. 
in Luke 15, 16, he's 17, he said, this is my command, love each other. This love that we have for each other in the body of Christ is supposed to be the mark of the church. In fact, Jesus said this in John 13, 35, by this all men will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. Love begins here. If we do not love each other in the church, then we won't be able to love those people out there in the world. We must start with loving each other in the body of Christ, and then we can reach out in love to our world. It is essential that we continue to obey God. If we are to obey the commands of God, one of those commands is to love our brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, you have to do this. It's an act of obedience. You can't choose which of the commands you want to obey and which you don't. He says to love each other, and we need to do it. Romans 13, 8 says, Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. See, to love one another is a commandment that we must continually love, live out. Um, it's not like you can check it off the box and, okay, I did that. It's a life you live, a life of love, that we live in obedience to God. Um, it is essential that as we do this, we remember that God lives in us. John writes, and this is how we know that he lives in us. We know it by the spirit he gave us. You see, we're not on our own. Uh, the love of God uh, has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Romans 5.5 5 says, And hope does not disappoint us, because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit, whom he has given us. See, each one of us uh, have God living in us by his Spirit. And God commands us, to love and it demonstrates that love by sending Jesus, his son, to be our savior. Jesus gave his life for us on the cross, defining what love is. And the Holy Spirit lives in us, providing the love we need to love others. So we have all of God, the Trinity of God, demonstrating love for us. God sending his son, Jesus dying for us in love, and the Holy Spirit, the spirit of love being poured into our hearts to help us. And I wanna just emphasize again as we close this study that we cannot um, love this way on our own. We need the love of God. And the love of God is poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Uh, in Galatians 5, it says that one of the fruits of the Spirit is love. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a result of our life being totally surrendered to God, filled with this Holy Spirit. And He comes and He fills us. And we're filled with this great Spirit of the love of God that we're meant to share with our world. It's not just for us. It is for us, but it's to be shared with our world. So praise the Lord for that. It's a great challenge for us from the Word of God here this morning. And um, uh, as you think about it, uh, it's something that we need to apply to our lives, isn't it? We are to live this life of love. So it's not just something that you can say, oh, that's an interesting fact. We have to go live it out. And it's not always easy. Uh, sometimes it's tough. But we, call, we are called to love others with the love of God, and God will help us as we do. So I hope you are blessed as you go try to apply this scripture to your life and continue to live this life of love that God calls us to live. Uh, let me pray for us. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for speaking to us. Thank you for this wonderful command that you give us to love each other. And we confess, Lord, we can't do that on our own. Uh, we need your help to have this kind of love, and you give it to us, Lord. You've given it to us, we experience it, you've demonstrated it for us, and you give it to us through the living presence of your Holy Spirit in us. So help us, Lord, to live it out in our own lives and to honor you in all that we do. So be with us, Lord, and uh, continue to help us as we live this life. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless you.